Good afternoon, 12 noon, September 22nd, 2021. I'd like to call to order the meeting of the City of Las Vegas Historic Preservation Commission. Our first item of business is to determine if we have a quorum. Will the City Clerk's Office representative please call the roll? Yes. Chair Stodal? Here. Vice Chair Laramie? Here. Commissioner Levine? Commissioner Beck? Here. Commissioner Hotchkiss? Here online. Commissioner Serfus? Commissioner Cosgrove? Here. Commissioner Palancar? Here. Commissioner Palacios? Here. Commissioner Long? Excused. Commissioner Moody? Here. Commissioner Seabrant? Here. Commissioner Gillespie? Here. Thank you. We do have a quorum. Thank you. Agenda item number two is simply announcements. Uh, first, has this meeting been properly noticed and posted in compliance with Nevada's open meeting law? Yes, it has. Thank you. Second announcement, in compliance with the current city procedures, the wearing of masks during today's meeting is in fact mandatory. Thank you in advance for your understanding and help. Item three, the third announcement is a reminder that the HBC's first meeting of 2024, excuse me, I'm way ahead of myself. And that will be a full agenda, by the way. The, the uh, third announcement is a reminder that our first meeting of 2022 will be held on January 27th rather than our normal Wednesday. We'll return to our regular fourth Wednesday meeting in February. Again, uh, for your calendars, it's Thursday, January the 27th. Uh, Chair, still remember the time has changed too. It's at 3 p.m. And uh, the, uh, the time is 3 p.m. Thank you. The last announcement comes from Dr. Seabrent, uh, and we're excited about it. Diane? Thank you, Seabrent, for the record. So uh, last time, uh, Director uh, Floyd did mention that we were getting a new employee uh, to assist with uh, both commissions, the HPC and Centennial. And to my left, I would like to introduce Teresa Smith. She joined us uh, just last week, so she's still brand new, but she's jumped in with both feet and is helping with all of the meeting agendas. And um, she will be doing the emails for calls for quorum. So when you get emails from Teresa Smith with City, uh, please make sure that you do respond to her. And she will be also doing tracking different um, projects that we do and weighing in on um, the administrative part of the job. Um, did you want to say a few words about yourself, Teresa? Oh. Uh, no, I don't have anything to say, but hello. <laughs> Thank you. Welcome. An exciting, uh, yeah. exciting time to have a full-time City Historic Preservation Officer, as well as now uh, an assistant to that officer. Great, thank you very much. Let's move on then to item number three, which is public comment. Public comment during this portion of the agenda must be limited to matters on the agenda for action. If you wish to be heard, come forward and give your name to the record. The amount of discussion and the amount of time any single speaker is allowed may be limited either in person or on the telephone. Any public comment at this time? Seeing and hearing none, we'll move on to agenda item four. This is an action item to approve the final minutes by reference of the regular meeting of August 25th, 2021. I look to the commission for a motion or uh, corrections, additions, changes. Is Commissioner Laramie, I make a motion to approve. We have a motion to approve. Do we have a second? Commissioner Beck, second. We have a motion. We have a second for the discussion by the board. Open to the general public for comment. Hearing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Excuse me, folks, aye. Those opposed? 
meeting carries unanimously with those in attendance with the chair voting in favor. Item number five, a report by the Development Department of the City Administration and the Department of Economic and Urban Development regarding adaptive reuse incentives for properties within the redevelopment area of the City of Las Vegas. Dr. Seabrand. Thank you, and Seabrand, for the record. Uh, this presentation is a direct request from Commissioner uh, Surface and Vice Chair Laramie had also expressed interest in hearing this topic um, uh, several meetings back and about what the city has done with adaptive reuse of old but not historically listed buildings and what the city does with adaptive reuse as a whole. And the two gentlemen with us today have agreed to give you a presentation and let you know what the city does in that regard. Thank you. Welcome. Uh, again, a reminder to the uh, commission, uh, this is a report only, not an action item. Please identify yourself and welcome. Good afternoon, commissioners. My name is Tom Burkhart. I am the City of Las Vegas Development Services Administrator. And today I'm joined with uh, Bill Arndt, who is the Deputy Director uh, for the Economic and Urban Development Department. So we are going to be uh, kind of tag teaming this presentation because the programs that we're going to be talking about today uh, some of the programs uh, my work unit, the Development Services Unit administers and, and others are handled by Economic and Urban Development. Uh, so what we have here is kind of the breakdown of the different programs that we're going to be talking about today. I'm going to start the presentation with the Downtown Business Assistance Program. And Bill's going to take the next three uh, programs, the Commercial Visu Visual Improvement Program, the Multifamily Residential Improvement Program and CPACE financing, which are all, again, administered by EUD. Tom, I know you're likely going to do that, but if, if, if as you're going through, uh, for example, the Downtown Business uh, Program, if you could indicate uh, the, some sort of the boundaries to what the definition of downtown. downtown Absolutely. Is. Yep. Thank you. We will cover that. Thank you. Um, and then finally, uh, I will again wrap up the presentation with some additional targeted incentive programs that again, we will uh, clearly define those boundaries. Uh, so uh, with the exception of, I believe, that CPACE program I mentioned earlier, all the programs that we're going to be talking about today um, are specific to our two redevelopment areas. So uh, on the exhibit here, we have the redevelopment area map which has uh, both the redevelopment area number one and redevelopment area number two, which as you can see basically aligns with our downtown master plan areas and those areas where we would be most focused on this adaptive reuse uh, goal. So starting with our downtown business assistance program, uh, this program was established back in 2016 and it was uh, intended to provide new businesses uh, project coordination and or financial assistance for the undertaking and rehabilitation of vacant commercial buildings uh, in those same redevelopment areas. Over the years, our budgets fluctuated, uh, but this current fiscal year, we have a $200,000 budget and we have a 20,000 max grant fund uh, per project. So. Again, our goal basically every year is to try to hit up to 10 projects uh, per fiscal year. The basics of why it was established, um, the council and mayor in response to um, you know, this growing interest in, in new businesses coming downtown, we're getting a lot of feedback from new businesses saying, hey, compared to building out in the suburbs or in some of these more established areas, there are some initial barriers to redeveloping downtown and opening these businesses up that we're trying to get assistance with. Oftentimes in those redevelopment areas, you're talking about older buildings that were built under obviously previous building codes, 40s, 50s, and 60s, for uses that are no longer in demand. So we kind of have a double whammy sometimes when that happens because one, we're going from a, let's say, 1950s code to a 2018 building and fire code but in a lot of these cases, we're also going from an old auto repair garage or mercantile business now to a place of assembly. So those code requirements for a higher occupant load trigger a lot more building and fire code upgrades. Um, in addition, you know, a lot of these buildings had decades of deferred maintenance and code upgrades. 
Uh, a lot of these buildings were buildings that back in 2006, 2007, when I think at the height of our uh, entitlement approvals for new high rises downtown, we had 42 projects entitled downtown and of those we built five, right? So a lot of those buildings that had been kind of earmarked for being demoed, obviously those businesses or property owners weren't putting any money into them for, for many, many years. And then of course, there's the goal that our planning department and uh, city manager, mayor, council all have of the desire to incentivize urban infill uh, and maintain some of these historic neighborhood characters over just simply demolition. So one half, and it's a pretty important half uh, of this program, our downtown business assistance program, is not just the financial incentive, but it's also um, the assistance with these new mom and pop businesses for project coordination. Oftentimes, these are the first time and maybe only time these businesses will be going through our city process. And the slide I have here, we, we actually did about 10 years ago when the city was converting from paper plan to electronic. And we basically outlined the potential of every step a new business or, or new pr uh, development project could potentially have to go through through our development services. So as you can see, I mean, without anyone obviously being able to read this, there are many, many, many steps involved in, in going from uh, cradle to grave with these projects. So in addition to some of the funding um, that I'm gonna talk about here in a minute, the other big assist that the city's trying to uh, coordinate with these new businesses is, is holding their hand through our development review process. So we'll go through some of the examples of the, of the projects that we've had since 2016. Uh, we tried to pick some that I think everyone's gonna be pretty familiar with here. Uh, Esther's Kitchen, uh, uh, 1130 South Casino Center, at Casino Center in California. Um, these are some uh, exterior and interior shots, uh, as you can see kind of in the upper right corner, uh, the before and lower right, the after. Most of these projects that we're gonna see are were, were demoed down to the studs on the inside, right? So, so there's not a lot to salvage on some of these older buildings and, and it's a pretty big lift as you'll see to, to convert some of these projects over. We picked this project to kind of walk through. These are some very common uh, upgrade requirements that most all these projects that we're gonna talk about have to go through. So again, thinking about the codes from the 40s, 50s, 60s to today, all the accessibility uh, upgrades that are now required per code, most of these buildings don't have. Most of these buildings don't have three-phase power. Uh, usually they're all single-phase where a lot of these new use types that we're trying to attract downtown need the three-phase power. Obviously, if it's a bar, restaurant, mechanical upgrades for hoods and similar, and in addition to grease interceptors. Um, but basically, what our program covers are all of those code-compliant costs so your you know, mechanical, plumbing, electrical, fire sprinklers, ADA, the health district requirements, those things that even if this build, the business fails, because we know some of these are gonna fail, uh, we feel that our investment in these projects is worthwhile because we now have a building that is at minimum brought up to 2018 code. And the improvements that we're doing a reimbursement on are things that obviously that business isn't going to take with them if they, you know, unfortunately had to go out of business. So in this example, and you'll probably see very similar numbers as we walk through it, um, just from the code compliant costs for this project, they were north of $282,000. Our program, as you can see, is kind of a drop in the bucket, really, when you look at the overall costs for some of these projects. Um, our program has a minimum of a four to one public to private investment ratio, but most of these you're gonna see about a 10 to one. Uh, Esther's, I believe, was on a prior fiscal year where we had 25,000. Again, currently we're at uh, 20,000 uh, from, a, from a reimbursement ratio. Vesta, very similar, you know, uh, former uh, retail uh, establishment now going to a place of assembly. Co-compliant cost on this project, 128,000. Uh, Vesta opened in 2016. Jammy Land, everything from a automotive repair to a sign shop, uh, now uh, bar restaurant, obviously trying to, as you can see, kind of from the picture on the left to the pictures on the right, 
a big component of their operation was activating that um, public realm, trying to bring some of that activity to the street, which is a pretty significant goal of what the planning department's trying to accomplish. Abel Baker Brewing, uh, previously Sal's Furniture, uh, as you can see in these pictures, you know, basically they were going below slab uh, for a lot of this remodel work. Uh, one of our more recent projects that opened in 2020, both Good Pie and Main Street Provisions, again, former furniture store, uh, was able to keep a lot of the same character of the building. As you can see, even though we have some lovely trees, it kind of blocks a little bit of the view of the facade of the building there. The pictures on the right are pictures that are pretty typical of what we see on the rooftops of these buildings too. Some of the things that normally you know, are out of sight and out of mind, but are pretty substantial in terms of cost for these new businesses coming in. Uh, these are some interior shots uh, on the right being Good Pie uh, before and after, and on the left being uh, Main Street Provisions. Again, both of these projects over $200,000 in just the code compliant costs, so our you know, funding reimbursement at almost a 10 to one ratio. Over the years, uh, from 2016 to 2021, we have had uh, reimbursement for uh, 46 projects in total. We, in addition to just the reimbursement, as I mentioned previously, some of these projects were just helping with project coordination. Of those, we had 165 within that same uh, redevelopment area. And regarding those 46 projects with the co-compliant upgrades, uh, you can see the total just under a million dollars of, of funds reimbursement. So that's kind of the summary of that downtown business assistance program, and I'm gonna hand it off to Bill to talk about his uh, economic and urban development projects. Thank you, Tom. Good afternoon, uh, Chair Soto, <laughs> members of the commission. Bill Lawrence, Deputy Director, Economic and Urban Development. Uh, I'm gonna outline some of the programs that we're doing through our redevelopment agency. As Tom has indicated, our redevelopment area is essentially the downtown area. Uh, it has some of the commercial corridors along Charleston, West Charleston and East Charleston, as well as Sahara, uh, and some of the neighborhoods uh, just east and just west of downtown. So we've tried to structure our programs not as a one-size-fits-all uh, program, because every building is different, every property owner is different, every business is different, and I think Tom alluded to that, the various types of businesses that we've helped. And so we've come up with some incentive programs to help uh, property owners in our redevelopment area. This first one, Visual Improvement Program, uh, you could think of this as our commercial facade program. So the idea was to fix up commercial facades in our greater downtown area. And the idea was very simple, to try to provide matching dollars to property owners or businesses going into these properties uh, to essentially renovate the exterior, revitalize the properties, it requires a dollar for dollar match. So for every dollar the property owner or the business puts in, we'll match that to a cap or a maximum of $25,000. Uh, in the past, we did go as high as $50,000, uh, but we've done a lot of properties, as you'll hear, in our greater downtown area, and so the demand was starting to wane, so we reduced the amount. We record a five-year maintenance uh, easement against the property. Uh, so the idea behind that was we wanted uh, some good faith from the property owner that they'd maintain the improvements, including the exterior, to a condition that was fitting for the investment the city was making. And it also serves as an incentive for avoiding speculators. So one of the things we did not want to do is uh, give grants to property owners that maybe were doing speculative ventures and would flip the property or uh, even worse, uh, move to demolish the property. Uh, so that served as a deterrent for an owner to doing that. Recording an easement on the record uh, has worked very well to make sure that the owners have maintained their properties. Uh, we allow most commercial businesses, again, this is for commercial properties, not for residential. We do have some exclusions uh, with the exception of some liquor licensed businesses. Most privileged licensed businesses are ineligible. Uh, we do make wedding chapels eligible. We made that policy change a couple of years ago because there was some interest from some of the chapels in our downtown to renovate. Uh, and I thought that would be of interest to this board. This is an example of a project we'd, we've done recently, uh, this uh, year, where it is uh, business uh, on Lake Mead. 
uh, near uh, J Street. And uh, it's called, it was called Seven Seas Liquor. And you see here the new owner, Westside Oasis. Uh, it's a $25,000 grant, and the owner is making a $960,000 private investment. We require that match to go to, into the exterior, but oftentimes these buildings are older and they need extensive interior work. Our money's meant to match the exterior, give the city some say over uh, the quality of the improvements. Uh, we're not necessarily reviewing for architectural design. We have others at the city, the, the uh, City Planning Commission and our planning department that do that, but we want to make sure it's a significant investment and a significant improvement. Uh, to date, we've done over 150 projects. Uh, this program has been around for quite a while. It started in uh, fiscal year uh, 2005, so 2004, 2005. Uh, and we've done uh, 156 projects over the life of the program. Uh, the interest in the program is kind of starting to slow and, and wane. And uh, I think what we're seeing is the buildings that we haven't gotten to, particularly in the downtown core, I think those are the kinds of buildings that uh, Mr. Burkhart was talking about that $25,000 just isn't enough. It's not gonna get you over the hurdle to actually bring these buildings back to life and get new tenants in. And so that's why uh, we created the DBAP program and are looking at other programs. Uh, we've had a multifamily residential improvement program. And this was, the idea was similar to the commercial VIP, but for multifamily uh, projects uh, where we'll invest uh, a, up to $75,000 and we require that the property owner invest a minimum of $20,000 per unit uh, in order to be eligible for the program. And the funds are designed to help the exterior and the interior of the project. Uh, the idea is to uh, reduce blight. Uh, we have some beautiful new uh, housing that has opened in recent years in downtown. But if you look at a greater perspective of downtown, most of the housing stock in downtown is quite old. And so we wanted to create a balanced approach. Not every property is so old and so dilapidated to where it couldn't be restored and put back to economic use. And so this was the idea of trying to breathe life into some of the, the residential properties in downtown. An example of that is a property on uh, 310 South Maryland Parkway. KLA Capital is the owner developer. Uh, Adam Fulot is the principal for this project. Uh, you see here on the left side the before of what the property looked like uh, when the owner was engaged uh, and then afterwards. Uh, so you see new roof, HVAC, mechanical systems, stucco repair, paint, landscaping, new windows and doors. Uh, simply put, you probably don't recognize it as the after and the before. But again, it's trying to breathe life into some of these older properties. Uh, again, you see here what the interior looked like before, uh, which was uh, pretty much gutted. And then you see after uh, framing, insulation, drywall, paint, flooring, electrical, uh, new plumbing, cabinets, vanities, countertops, and doors. Uh, and so it's really putting these properties back to use, realizing that New development takes time. Not everything uh, needs to be a mid-rise or high-rise project, but we can create some really quality housing uh, that meets the needs of our workforce and our downtown residents. Uh, you see here an investment of over $600,000, of which 75,000 was a reimbursement from our redevelopment agency. Another tool is uh, CPACE, Commercial Property Assessed Clean Energy. Uh, this is one actually that I and my office don't, do not manage. Uh, Marco Vallotta for the city manages this program, uh, but we certainly work with Marco and the rest of the city team on marketing the program. And this is one that I think is an untapped tool and I think that we wanna think creatively about how can we use this tool maybe with some other additional incentives or inducements to get some property owners of historic properties or older properties to take a look at. We think it's a great tool for these properties. It is eligible for commercial buildings, industrial buildings, or multifamily of five units or more. Uh, for new construction, it provides up to 20% of the capital cost of a project. But for renovation projects, potentially up to 100%. Uh, and the premise of it is you take energy efficiency improvements, bringing buildings up to 
uh, the current uh, electrical code and the energy code for the city, uh, and then taking those uh, improvements and monetizing them, the city for, uh, records a self-assessment lien. My, it, you can think of it like an SID lien. It's a superior lien against the property. So it's not like a traditional commercial loan. It's specialized financing. The term can be up to 25 years. It's typically between 15 and 25 years. We have partners with uh, preferred uh, developers uh, and ar architects that do a lot of the review work on trying to do a technical review on what those energy improvements would look like. I do not have a slide for the project, but the, the one project that of note that did use this tool is the Allen Bible Building, uh, which is the building at Las Vegas Boulevard in Garces. Sletton Construction uh, was the owner developer, and the tool helped them renovate that building and make a lot of energy improvements to the building. So I think this is a tool that uh, I think we'd like to take a closer look at on how we can maybe partner with uh, her store, our historic preservation team at the city on trying to make this financing available for uh, property owners. Uh, the website for more information on this, I should have included it on the slide, but I did not, is VegasCPace.com. And again, it's sponsored by the city, but we also have private service partners, uh, including SRS, which is listed here on the slide. I'm gonna turn it back to Tom to cover the last two, a uh, sewer connection fee deferral. Um, and also uh, an origination fee waiver uh, in part of our downtown. Thank you, Bill. So the uh, sewer connection fee deferral program, as you can see by the slide, we established this program back in 2013. And um, in short, what a sewer connection fee is and how it relates to adaptive reuse is, again, going back to the prior uses of these buildings and, and what these buildings are being converted over to. Uh, over the years, the codes that change are usually codes that require additional restrooms. Uh, some of these uses that were old auto repair garages that are now restaurants have additional uh, sinks and, and drains. And basically every one of these connections uh, has a fee associated with that connection that is usually due at the time that the permit is issued. So it's really a pretty substantial cost for a new business when looking at the overall permit fee just to start construction. Uh, as we note here, uh, every year this, this fee goes up and it's basically a fee to buy capacity in our sewer system. And currently, uh, for new bars and restaurants, that fee can reach up to over $3,000 per fixture. Um, so what this program basically uh, was intended to do was our uh, city manager's office said, let's try to figure out a way, again, to try to keep as much money in these developers' pockets as possible so they can reinvest that money into the building and not worry so much about having to pay the city up front all these costs just to start construction. And in this case, you know, we will just put them on a, on a, on a deferred payment program that basically allows them to open their door it allows them to start generating revenue before they have to pay the city that remaining balance of the fee. Uh, so one example that I gave that, that uh, just to kind of break down what these cost numbers really can do for a project uh, was the uh, new barbecue restaurant Soul Belly on Main Street. And as you can see from the picture above, it was an old transmission repair shop. Obviously, again, going to a restaurant, this is a big uh, increase in, in terms of that sewer demand. And the breakdown of what they had, they were adding 16 new water fixtures. Uh, so they had a total, and, and again, they did have some credits on this one from the prior business, but basically they had a total city building permit fee of just over $41,000, but the portion of that fee that was tied direct to the sewer connection was $37,000. So essentially 90% of that permit fee was just tied to the, to the cost of, of connecting additional lines to our sewer system. So what this program was able to do was it said, okay, the initial $10,000 is going to always be due at the time of the permit issuance, but we're gonna defer that remaining balance. So in this case, we were able to defer, you know, essentially two thirds of that permit fee to the point where these folks were open and operating before they had to start paying the city back. So again, th these are those things that we're looking at as what are those barriers to entry for, for new businesses moving in? 
and what are those uh, city fees, those city impact fees that we can try to save on our side of having to pay us so that way that business owner or developer can again put that money into that building and really try to support that adaptive reuse of the, some of these old structures. Uh, similarly, the, the business license origination fee waiver program that was just passed uh, back on May 19th, uh, again tried to tackle what are those upfront city fees that are sometimes barriers to entry for these new businesses. Uh, one of the more expensive fees that the city charges right now is the licensing origination fee. And what an origination fee is, it's basically a one-time fee tied to any privilege license, an alcohol license, that basically makes that license an asset license where in the future that business can typically sell that license to any private party if they happen to go out of business. We've done origination fee waivers in the past um, and for this new program, uh, the uh, city management and city council wanted to set this program up aligned with our new brewery row. So on the right side of the slide here, you'll see the boundaries of our new brewery row boundary. Uh, which basically, I believe, goes Bonneville to the north, uh, Union Pacific to the west. It jogs a little bit down near Wyoming and Oki on the south side and then picks back up on Las Vegas Boulevard uh, to the east. But basically what this program again allows for is any new business moving into that district that is opening up a, either a new craft brew pub, a craft distillery, a winery, or a manufacturer the ability to waive that one-time license fee that's typically due at the time of applying for the business license, as you can see on the slide, up to, depending on the license type, $50,000 for, for uh, just entry into the um, application. And the, the, the way that we've kind of balanced this uh, waiver program is all of the existing licenses that have already been issued for those businesses that did pay that origination fee they still have that asset, right? So, so this program is, 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 uh, was approved for two years, and anyone that gets this waiver would not then be able to obviously transfer or, or sell that license, so it kind of protects some of those businesses over the years that have made that investment. So again, this, this program obviously is through our actually planning department and business licensing um, division. But again, we thought it would be important to include on this adaptive reuse presentation because it's just another uh, example, I guess, of the different ways that the cities kind of analyze their internal fees and, and those barriers to entry for some new businesses that might be looking at, you know, one area of town over the other. And when they look at downtown, oftentimes it's those unforeseen costs, those unforeseen issues, the, the, like I talked about earlier, the grease interceptors, the handicap accessible restrooms, those things that in the suburbs they would already have because those buildings were built, you know, uh, under newer codes. But those were kind of the gotcha things downtown that they hadn't budgeted for and they hadn't anticipated on. So that kind of in a nutshell really is where these, you know, uh, incentive programs try to bridge that gap between that developer, that new business's budget and oftentimes the real costs associated with rehabbing these buildings. So I believe that wraps up our presentation, and if there are any questions, we'd be more than happy to try to answer. Well, Tom and, and Bill, I, I really appreciate the, the detail, uh, not only from a Historic Preservation Commission, but a citizen of the community. It was really good to hear some of the, uh, the details of, of what your two agencies provide. Let me look around and uh, uh, see if there's any any question? Let's, let's go. Yeah, ahead. Commissioner Surface, uh, I requested this report, and thank you, Dr. Seberg, for bringing these two gentlemen in to speak to us. Uh, really, really, uh, really pleased with all of your efforts. And um, I just uh, wanted maybe a more candid discussion in a very positive way. What other barriers are you encountering? You know, if you, it looks like you've taken them on head on. I'm wondering about the entitlement process where uh, in that political arena someone may be discouraged
because of not getting all the votes, you know, uh, for a license or a use permit, that type of thing. Is there anything going on in that area that you're keenly aware of where the city needs to make some modification to their ordinances to make uh, adaptive reuse more friendly uh, to the development community? So on the entitlement side, uh, Commissioner, um, most of the projects that we reviewed here that would have that, that level of a review through either Planning Commission or City Council are those ones that require a special use permit. So if it's alcohol related, it's an automatic. One of the changes that the Planning Department did make over the years to try to um, kind of streamline, I guess, that approval process was, they, I think they looked at some of the uh, records of how many of these projects were actually getting denied, right? And, and then they looked at ways that they may be able to convert some of those projects that require a special use permit, which is maybe a three to four month process, to what the planning department calls a conditional use approval. One example are the businesses that only want to serve beer and wine only. And usually those are those restaurants, have a restaurant, uh, don't have an off-sale component, not serving hard liquor. So planning, and Mike, you may know this offhand, but uh, it was probably three or four years ago, uh, made a change in the zoning code to say, hey, let's change all of these businesses from having to get a use permit to this conditional use approval. As long as it meets, I think, a 400 foot distance separation from protected uses, uh, they are now able to approve that administratively. So there are some of those examples in here, but more so what we try to do on the, that, that slide that had the whole development process on there, was in those cases where they did still have a, a, a planning commission or city council review process, we still try to get them involved earlier on with the building permit phase. So we're almost stacking those reviews together. So instead of doing um, consecutive reviews, we're, we're trying to do them concurrent. And, and, and basically, you know, time, time being money with these folks trying to get open as soon as possible, you know, they, as long as they're understanding that risk, right? So if they go in there, like the Soul Belly Project as an example, I think they may have been one that um, said, okay, if we're, we're doing a, a barbecue restaurant, yes, we'd like to serve alcohol. Uh, we are comfortable moving forward with our full TI build out in the event that for whatever reason, it's deemed that, you know, we've, we've got too much alcohol in the area and planning commissioner council votes us down, we're still comfortable moving forward with that plan check process. So it's kind of that time saving issue, but from a cost standpoint, the, the real one that we're trying to tackle and we've been trying to tackle for a few years now, and it definitely has the attention of the, uh, the city manager's office is the utilities. So the, the utility has been a huge challenge downtown because over the years, you know, I, I think the, the, the concept was that a lot of these alleys downtown may eventually be vacated for projects like the Jewel Project, and we would have a full city block development, and for that reason, a lot of the uh, 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 water lines with the water district were moved out of the, out of the alleys to the east-west streets, but now that we're seeing the projects like we have on Main Street coming in, and trying to promote kind of these infill projects as opposed to just demoing and building brand new, um, they are in a real difficult situation of trying to run private lines basically down alleys to try to connect to those east-west streets because the water district doesn't want to mess around with our alleys anymore and it, it just kind of creates an issue there. So you, you probably see walking around downtown a lot of these funky little backflow preventers and, and um, you know, uh, uh, utility uh, pad sites that don't look the prettiest uh, and we're, we're working with the planning folks right now to try to figure out the, trying to make the best of the possibly, you know, worst design scenarios because obviously they're a necessity, but we're, we're trying to figure out how to, you know, make both sides happy, the utilities and, and of course our planning department. Great, thank you for the report and uh, I, I, I know you touched on it, but I can't say how much of a difference the Main Street couplet has made in improving the streetscape. You know, you have some real assets downtown. It's walkable, it's got its charm that uh, you don't have out in sprawl land, so to speak. Right. And uh, I think you should tell your story more. You're doing a great job. And then keep us aware of these barriers. And, and you know, we're, we're advocates for this uh, redevelopment and repositioning of these 
wonderful old assets. So um, love to hear kind of updates on a regular basis. And I appreciate your candor with telling us about some of the barriers you're undergoing and maybe we can help you support overcoming them. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Pal and Carr for the record. Um, I was curious, um, the people that come in to purchase, they purchase the property first, is that correct? Then they come to you? So for my program, oftentimes they're, they're not the property owner. Oh. So we, we reimburse whoever that individual is that's doing the work. Uh, I would say probably 90% of the time it's the tenant. And, and that's what we found historically over the years is that, you know, oftentimes, unfortunately, that tenant is left with the onus of trying to bring another person's property up to up the current code. So the way we, we set up our program was to say, we tie, that code compliant work is always tied to what the building department calls their tenant improvement plan that results in a certificate of occupancy. So, like I said, 90% of the time, the tenant bears that cost of the TI work to get that new occupancy in the building. And whatever is listed on that tenant improvement plan that qualifies under building code, fire code, health code regulations and requirements, not um, elective upgrades, not soft costs, not cosmetic, that Bill talked a little bit about the, the exterior cosmetics, but those things that are going to stay in that building, so again, even unfortunately, if that business goes out of business, now at least we have a building that's up to current code that, you know, that, that next person could go in. But the purchasing of the building initially is done by the people whom you support after, is that correct? I mean, you, you buy the property, then you realize you need additional funds to to get it where you want it, they go to you. So most of the time, there are some cases where the owner will redevelop the building. Oftentimes what you'll see there is they'll usually bring it up to what the building department calls a shell, a gray shell, where they kind of prep it for that tenant to then come in. But a lot of the pro projects that we've had have actually been where, just like anywhere else, a tenant would see a for, for lease sign and, and contact that owner, that, that agent rep, and negotiate out that, that, that rent, right? And um, we try to always catch them before that, right? Because okay. unfortunately, sometimes by the time they get to us, by the time they get into the planning process, they've already signed a lease. They think that they only need to do X amount of improvements, and then they find out really what they need to do to bring the building up to code. So we always try to catch them as early as we can in the process, but in those cases kind of where they've already crossed that point of no return, that was really kind of the, the reason why the program was created because we would get so many calls from folks going, I didn't know I had to put in a grease interceptor. I didn't know I had to upgrade ADA requirements. I didn't know I had to do all these things that now the owner may or may not be helping me with or may or may not be giving me TI credits for and the onus is kind of on, on me, the business owner, trying to do all this work for maybe a building I only have a five-year lease or a couple options on. So that, that's why in our program, we tied it directly to that individual that's actually paying the expense to bring that building up to code. And that's a great program. But um, what about the people, uh, their background and their finances? I mean, if you have people coming who are real developers, and have millions of dollars behind them, do you still help those people? Or I so, mean, do you look into that prior to just turning over the money for them? We, we, yeah, we do have some qualifiers. Uh, we tried to basically make our qualifiers to target the smaller mom and pop businesses, right? right. So we have square footage, maximum square footage uh, um, thresholds. And, and, but then the, the real one that kind of ties it to the mom and pop business is that our program is set up to be first come, first serve for those individuals that get that TI for C of O, Certificate of Occupancy, on their permit. And 99% of the time, the people that are pulling that permit are the business operators as opposed to the property owner or the you know, master landlord. Okay. Yeah. Uh, for the record, Bill Arntz, uh, for some of the redevelopment agency programs, we kind of structured ours the same way. 
the multifamily, for instance, we go up to $75,000, and you saw there the leverage where uh, it was close to 10 to one. Most of the investors that we're working with are not the huge national real estate companies that would be building new projects, uh, 150, 200, 300 units. They're smaller investors. And so we looked at it not as on a need basis where how much resources do you have, but really leverage. With, with our participation, it's really structured in a way to be an inducement to make the investment. So if it's really attracting that investor to invest in these older properties where instead of investing there, they might not invest in our downtown, they might go to another city or just overlook our, our downtown area overall. So we looked at it more of uh, how can we create an incentive that's reasonable but then attract the, the private investment dollars. So there's no uh, minimum or maximum as far as the, uh, the what individual wealth of the investor developer. There's no credit check, it's a grant. So we try to keep it pretty simple, but we did set some minimum investment criteria for the uh, a minimum investment of $20,000 per unit, because we didn't want those investors that I would label speculators, where they're just coming in, doing the bare minimum, trying to make a quick buck, dumping their money in, renovating it, uh, and then selling it. We wanted somebody who would be interested in, in the long haul and, and maintaining the property for a long period of time. Thank you. This is um, Commissioner Laramie. So I just have a couple questions and forgive my naiveness about this, but where does the, where does the money come from? So how do you determine your budgets? You mentioned it kind of fl fluctuates. So can we advocate to get you more money? <laughs> yeah, and, and we actually, uh, obviously when you start a new program, it takes a little time to gain traction, right? So the first few years, we were at 250000 but we didn't, we didn't uh, use the full budget. Because by the time, again, you get the word out, most of these projects, when you look at um, the overall development timeline, you're, you're usually looking at about a six month, you know, minimum process. So even if we started with somebody uh, mid-year, they usually finished on the, on the opposite side of the next fiscal year. So, so um, our obviously city fiscal year resetting July 1. Um, the first few years when we didn't utilize that full budget, that's kind of what happens, right? They say, well, we're, we're gonna take a little decrement out of that, uh, out of that budget. This past year, um, I think we actually partnered with the redevelopment agency because we had more than the 10 projects to bridge that gap between us. So we've kind of taken a look year by year and, and um, tried to analyze how many projects we had in. The, the good thing to date is we haven't had to turn anyone down. So, so where we have had some gaps, we've worked with the Economic and Urban Development Department because the program actually started years ago in EUD, uh, and then it transitioned over once my development services work unit kind of became a thing when we had the old development services center. We were the ones that were more hands-on with the permits and the processing, so it just kind of made sense to move that program over to us. Um, but yeah, basically every year, it's a general funded uh, program. We kind of look at how many we had last year. We look at, um, you know, how many are in the pipeline for this year. And I, I don't know if I mentioned this before, but we wait until the project is done. So we will reserve the funds once that permit is issued, but that project has to obtain its certificate of occupancy, so basically pass all their inspections and also obtain their business license. So the idea that mayor, council, and city manager's office had was all these old boarded up buildings. We wanted the ribbon cutting with the mayor out there and new jobs, new taxes, new business. So, so sometimes there's a gap in terms of when that we actually reimburse on the, on the tail end of it. But I don't know if that answered your question specifically, but basically this year it's at 200,000 and we've been trying to work collectively to make sure that we don't have to turn anyone down should we uh, get more than we anticipated. Gotcha, and so, and so that initial amount comes just from the general fund from being distributed out to Correct. your department. Right. And what happens 
with um, on the programs that are loans where you're collecting interest, what happens with the interest? Does that go back towards the program or is that covering other fees? So, so the sewer, the only one that has that 5% that is a sewer connection fee deferral program. And that basically just go, the, the excuse me, the uh, sewer connection fee is a, pa what building and safety kind of refers to as a pass through fee. They collect it, but it ultimately goes to our sewer division. So basically that whole fee just gets rolled back over to, to our sewer division. Gotcha. And um, last question, the visual improvement program, does that also cover the restoration of signage? So it could be used to restore neon signage? And if so, would that have to be paired with the facade improvement or could it just go towards a standalone sign? Uh, uh, Vice Chair, uh, for the record, Bill Arnn's correct. We, uh, we can and do use the Visual Improvement Program for signage. Uh, usually buildings that are going to undertake that expense, neon signage is very expensive, are doing a lot of other work to the buildings, but that is an eligible expense. We have uh, seen that. Um, and I've, we've seen that also in the multifamily. I should mention we have a lot of the old motor lodges on East Fremont. Uh, some of those are converting into a use for multifamily as opposed to the traditional lodging. Uh, but that issue consistently comes up. There's some very important signage that to our community, regardless of the nature of the historic nature of the building, whether or not it's historic, uh, nearly all those signs, if not all the monies, Fremont certainly are historic. And so we, we work closely with the, the city team and historic preservation when those issues come up to try to to try to address signage uh, either through these formal programs or uh, inside agreements when needed to try to preserve those old signs. Great, and I'm sorry, I have one more question. On, on the CPACE program, are there very specific or strict guidelines about what constitutes as um, an energy efficiency upgrade, and I'm specifically thinking like if a property owner wanted to pursue, let's say, a historic tax credit, and they were going to be held to some higher standards for restoring the building, would the CPACE program be something they could perhaps layer into that, knowing that they might need to keep some windows or some other aspects that are probably not going to reach the same efficiency if they were like a total replacement. For the record, Bill Arndt, uh, I think the answer is uh, potentially. So one of the requirements of the CPACE is that if there's modernization, so to speak, the building has to be brought to the current uh, international energy code that the city has adopted. So if there are deviations from that code, even if they're approved by city building, that may kind of rule it in or out as far as eligibility with CPACE. Uh, but it's absolutely a potential funding source, so it's something that we definitely should take a look at. Uh, as long as the project meets the energy code requirements, the answer is yes, it could be eligible. And then the second question is, will it be eligible for how much? And I think one of the misnomers about the program is, well, it's just energy efficiency, so I'm just changing out lighting fixtures, I'm not doing that much, but energy efficiency means uh, the HVAC system, the electrical system, uh, windows, doors, uh, potentially roofing, so it, it can add up very quickly, and uh, that incentive can be uh, potentially a, a pretty lucrative incentive for uh, an owner developer. Great. Well, thank you. Just to echo the other sentiments, this was really informative, and I really appreciate you taking the time to be here. Thank you. Other questions from the uh, yeah. a couple of questions. Well, it's good to see that there is still some taxpayer protection efforts here. Uh, the five-year uh, 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 maintenance agreement. Uh, but then you indicated that 90% of that goes to the, 90% uh, of the applicants are non-owners. Does the owner have to sign off on this in any way? Uh, for the record, Bill Arndt, uh, for the VIP program and uh, the other programs, yes, absolutely. The VIP program, for instance, 
There's an easement agreement recorded against the property. It actually hits title. Uh, the landlord, if it's a landlord tenant, they actually uh, sign an estoppel agreeing to allow the tenant to proceed with the improvements. Uh, and uh, we've actually have turned away some where the owner wasn't willing to do that. And we said, well, but we want to make sure these improvements last for five years. And if you're, the, the logic was most commercial leases are a minimum of five to seven years. So it's not an unreasonable requirement. It's been very few we've had to turn away, just, to, just a handful. But most of the owners, uh, once they understand that uh, it's not, there's not an intention of the city is using it as a code enforcement lien. It's, it's simply trying to make sure that the improvements are done and, and maintained. Right. So if, it, if it's signage, if it's land, we use funds for landscaping uh, for uh, the facade that they that they maintain the facade because that's an important part of our downtown to not only get the improvements in but to maintain them as well. Well, and, and where I'm going with the, the question is the the idea that uh, well, let me back up just a hair. Two different agencies kind of covering different aspects, but how does what is often confusing to me this term big enchilada? How does that, what's your agency's relationship with that? And, and the next question is going to be connected to the, to the first one, this issue of signage and the protection of the taxpayer. You're talking $20,000, $25,000, but some of these businesses are getting 50, 60, 80, $100,000 for, for restoring these signs. So. Can you, first of all, address what's your relationship with the big enchilada, uh, uh, specifically with visual improvement and, and just general reinvestment? Uh, sure, for the record, Bill Arndt. Uh, so enchilada, Project Enchilada, um, I think some may have called it big enchilada. Uh, it's really an initiative of the city. So the city recognized that uh, there's a, a specific part of our downtown that is so historic in nature and as such unique assets that we have to do something above and beyond. Okay. So we invested in money into streetscape along Fremont Street. Uh, we've, uh, as a city, has, and it's really been a, a multi-departmental team, have approached the property owners about the historic signage and the neon signage, uh, many of which uh, were on these old motor lodges. And, and uh, to Commissioner Surface's earlier question as far as challenges, I think one market challenge that we're wrestling with, and I don't know that we have the perfect answer or solution to present to you today, but I think it's appropriate given the scope of the commission to raise the issue, is the market pressure. So there's market pressure for all these old commercial buildings on the old motor lodges to no longer use them as motels or hotels, but for, for apartments. And so that presents a number of challenges on a land use side, on the business licensing side, we've had a lot of conversations with our city planning team about this. Uh, and then the, the result of that is if we don't resolve that issue, the property can sit idle. The, whoever owns the property today will still own the property, sitting idle meaning sitting vacant, and it's not put to productive use, which is not good for the city, it's certainly not good for the owner, they're not getting income off the property. And then it puts any historic nature of the buildings, but particularly the signs at risk. So we have done uh, some uh, individual agreements with some property owners that you referenced to try to uh, acquire the sign for preserving uh, for the Neon Museum. Uh, the, the city has acquired some signs uh, directly. I think Blue Angel is one. Uh, so we have done that uh, on an individual basis, but it. From my perspective, it's kind of been a workaround solution because we haven't figured out across all the properties in that area, how do we keep the building going and put it to productive use? Some of them have converted to uh, residential, but some of them are still sitting idle and sitting vacant. Well, I will say personally or professionally, whichever way, that's, that's my concern. If we invest $100,000 to beautify Fremont Street by restoring a historic sign but we haven't figured out what to do with the building. Uh, it makes me nervous about the investment of the $100,000 and there needs to be something in there that if the taxpayers are gonna do that, spend the money, it needs to be 
owned somehow by the, uh, but, but I think you're right. We've got to figure out the back side uh, as we're figuring out, 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 out the front side. Uh, uh, Bill, was there any, or, uh, I'm sorry. Did, uh, Tom, did you want to add to that at all? So from our side, uh, Chairman, we, with the downtown project, um, really have been involved with them from a co project coordination standpoint since they were established. As everyone probably knows, they've had a lot of different concepts and ideas and visions and those sorts of things. And um, outside the box thinking is always great, but it doesn't always match one to one with zoning codes and building codes and those sorts of things. So our, our involvement with, with DTP over the years and, and also with Project Enchilada has been more on trying to coordinate the process standpoint, uh, more so than any of our programs. I, I think, again, our programs are given the money that they had and were willing to invest, uh, not something that they were really actively looking to pursue for, you know, various reasons. One, one the two quick flash questions. There's several schools in the East Fremont area. Do you work with a school district in Hawaii, <coughs> either one of you, as far as the development of businesses or in that area? Are they, are they involved in that process in any way, either? The, um, the school district on, uh, could you repeat the question? Well, there's a, there's a couple of schools in the, in the older part of, of, of downtown Las Vegas. Is there any work that your either agency does in communicating with the school district, uh, uh, just, just in general term? I think most of our formal communication with the school district still comes from the planning department, where anytime there's a formal land use application, okay. the school district's notified of that, of okay. that application. So we, we then again, we're, we're kind of that uh, liaison coordinator with the city and with the developer in terms of trying to navigate that process. But the reason I ask that is in the beginning part of your presentation, you talked about how the zoning rules and regulations have changed over, over the decade. And there are several businesses near the schools and with signage and so forth. I was just was questioning whether there's any ongoing communication with, with them that, uh, with, with the new code. Thank you. The last question is, is either one of your agencies involved with the Huntridge in any way, either through requests for funding or planning or anything? Uh, Chair Stodall, for the record, Bill Arntz. Uh, we have been communicating with the owner, Jay Dapper, and his firm. Uh, I personally got a tour very recently within the last okay. 10 days of the property. We're really excited about what's being proposed. There have been no formal funding requests. Right. Uh, we did uh, work with the same owner for property on the other side of Charleston, on the north side of Charleston, uh, known in the community as the Mahoney's Drum Shop. Uh, we did help out with that building. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, to date, uh, he's not asked for any assistance, but uh, it is a big undertaking, and we do have a line of communication open and are so, certainly willing to work with the, the property owner to make sure that that project's successful and preserves the, the history of such an important community asset. Great. Thank you. And I'll, uh, Chair, echo my prior comments uh, with Dapper Companies as well, where we, we've mostly been involved with them from a project coordination standpoint. They, I don't believe, for any of the projects that they've uh, rehabilitated, gone through our downtown business assistance program okay. for grant funding. Um, on that particular project, and I'll look to Mike, I don't believe that they've submitted their entitlement reviews yet, which is usually where we will first start to engage with them. So up until this point, I think it's just been the conceptual entitlement planning. review. Is that what you said? The yes. uh, entitlement review. Gotcha. So it kind okay. of starts I with know. the very first meeting with planning is what they call the pre-application conference, and we kind of go from there. But that's usually where we'll first start our project coordination efforts. Well, uh, I also want to echo the other members of the commission. It's really uh, uh, been a very informative, and I appreciate the details of uh, both Tom and, and Bill. It's uh, uh, thank you for all the, all the work and, and the presentation. Any last thoughts here? Hearing none, again, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Let's move on to agenda item number six, which is 21-0546 HPC1 discussion. This is an action item regarding the Historic Preservation Commission choosing a date in October to attend a virtual design review training session provided by the Nevada State Historic Preservation Office staff. There are two elements in this agenda item uh, for the HPC to consider. 
the first, whether the commission wants to move forward with this training session, and then second, the selection of a date. Um, and the recommended time is, is would be 6 p.m. So I'll open it up for uh, uh, discussion. You all have a, a slide in front of you, Dr. Dan Siever? Okay, sorry, Siever, for the record. Can I do a few explanations first before please. you open it up for comment, please? Please. Thank you, sir. So this is, again, um, a direct request. This was from Vice Chair Laramie about uh, design review training. And because we are a CLG, um, SHPO does offer uh, free training sessions. And they can give this commission a, it's really just a really brief one hour introduction and it would be over a, a Zoom call and the best time for SHPO would be at 6 p.m. in the evening and we would have to choose a date. And the idea of this, if the commission wishes to pursue this, is if this is something that everybody would be on board with, then after that initial training, then we can look at doing a more in-depth design review training program. And in the backup material, there is, um, again, since we are now members of the National Alliance for Preservation Commissions, we can request specialized training. Um, there would be a cost to it that the HPC would have to um, pay for out of their budget. But we can, I can coordinate that. I don't have a date and I don't have a cost yet because I'm right now gauging what the commission would like to do. There also in the back material, I also included a list of different organizations that do offer not just design review training, but different types of training. So I think today is really to see if we want to kick off um, starting a, a fairly robust training program for, for the members. And again, it's starting with that SHPO training. Um, I think most of you know the architectural historian there, Kristen Brown, um, very knowledgeable, would be able to give a great presentation to everybody. And if everybody did decide on a date, we can take a vote now. Otherwise, we will send out a doodle.com poll to choose a date of Monday, the on October 11th, Tuesday, October 12th, Wednesday, October 13th, Tuesday, October 19th, or Wednesday, October 20th. So happy to answer any questions or Chairman Stoddard, I'll turn it back over to you. Thank you. So the, uh, the two questions are, one is, is if we'd like to uh, move forward as a commission, uh, to schedule this training and then two Excuse me. I'm sorry, can you turn your mic on, please? If we can decide today uh, which of the dates uh, would be the, uh, the date to schedule, uh, the more time we can give SHPO in advance would be, would be very helpful. For, first of all, do we want to move forward with this? I'm seeing, I'm seeing uh, e either nodding heads or no heads. Uh, uh, let me reverse this. Anybody that doesn't want to, you, first of all, you don't have to participate. No, it's, 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 it's completely really voluntary. voluntary. I mean, it's, it's 6 p.m. in the evening, so it's on your off time, but it, it's, it's up to you. We're just offering this training for anybody who wishes to participate. So then I would uh, uh, look for, is there a, a date that is unusable for anybody? Commissioner Laramie, um, the later two dates, the October 19th and October 20th, are unavailable for me. Okay. I'm in the same position as Commissioner Laramie on those two dates. So does anybody have a problem with either the 11th, 12th, or 13th at 6 p.m.? Please. I, I would prefer it not be on the 13th if possible. All right. Does anybody have a problem with the 11th or the 12th at 6 p.m.? We're checking our watches, our clocks, our iPads. So then I would look for uh, a motion to have the Historic Preservation Officer schedule a training session for October the 12th at 6 p.m. I would look for a motion first. Commissioner Laramie, um, before I make the motion, I just wanted to comment that I have um, had the opportunity to attend the camp training, and it's really, really great. It's very engaging, a lot of good information. And while I was pretty comfortable with the design review process before going to that training, it definitely 
brought up things that I hadn't really thought about and gave me um, some new, I guess, new techniques and, and ways of, of looking at that. So I can't recommend the camp training enough um, if we do move on to, to fuller training, more robust training in the future. With that said, I motion to approve um, the design review training with SHPO on either the 11th or 12th to be confirmed um, by Diane at a, at a later date. At 6 p.m.? At 6 p.m. Further comments? Excuse me, and that motion was for the 11th or 12th? Not for the 12th? The 11th or 12th would be confirmed by, uh, okay. uh, by uh, Thank you. Mm -hmm. Commissioner Beck, I second the motion. Okay, we have a motion and we have a second for the discussion. Hearing and seeing them, general public. Hearing and seeing them. All those in favor say aye. 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 Watch your source, aye. Those opposed? Seeing or hearing them. The motion carries unanimously with those in attendance with the chair voting in favor. Great, thank you. Thank you very much. Maybe we'll move through that. Uh, Chairman Stroh, can I uh, just, just interrupt for a moment, please? Sorry. Um, for the, the city clerk, I'm sorry, I failed to let you know that Commissioner Levine had to leave. He did send me a text that um, he had to leave. It was in the middle of item five. If he can be excused from that. Thank you. Thank you. I have him excused at 1228. Thank you. One, uh, one other uh, suggestion is a follow up on what the vice chair was talking about. I think your board packet is the, the camp program. Um, I suggest reviewing that and if there's a, a particular class or seminar uh, that is of interest to you from mid-century to design review, please send that to uh, uh, the historic <coughs> preservation officer. We'll see what kind of interest there, there is in uh, the, these training classes. And uh, can I just remind everybody when they email me to please include Teresa as well? It's tsmith at lasvegasnevada.gov. Right. And again, this goes directly to, to uh, the, the city staff rather than to, uh, uh, to each, uh, each of the commissioners. This is just a, a direct point. Uh, the other thing is also in your packet is a list of other places, uh, training opportunities. Uh, a couple of them are, are, are new to me. Uh, but I'd suggest taking a look at, at that as well and see if there's anything that you think would help this board. The, the board packet. Commissioner um, Palancar, this is the um, email that the city clerk office always sends out a week in advance, and you can access all the backup material online. Uh, Commissioner Beck, I just wanted to mention that several years ago, I believe we had a camp training program here for two days, and it really was beneficial to all of us. And and in historic preservation, things are quickly changing, so I'm very supportive of having the training program again. And the cost is minimal. I mean, this, we're not talking, uh, uh, the challenge will be that that stole off of the record that uh, uh, for the foreseeable future is likely they're going to be vi virtual rather than uh, somebody flying out here and giving us a, a class. But that's, that's all, hopefully, will we'll change. Further comments? Hearing none, we'll move on to item seven, which is a uh, report by the Department of Planning on the summer preservation webinars presented by the National Alliance of Preservation Commissions. Dr. Siebert. Thank you, Siebert, for the record. And I think I left my notes upstairs, but that's okay, I remember it. Uh, so this is from the training, um, uh, the six webinars that were available. Hopefully everybody had an opportunity to view them, if not live. Everybody did receive the email that they are available to you for up to 60 days from the August 25th date. 
So you can uh, watch those now if you haven't been able to view them yet. There's also quite a bit of interesting material that's attached to um, each training uh, webinar. And this is just to, and it's um, fortunate that Commissioner Levine had to leave because he's the one that requested this. <laughs> um, uh, but um, just to get, give the board members an opportunity to discuss what they felt, the, how the training was, anything they wanted to weigh in on. I found myself that the, um, a couple of the very interesting ones was the um, translating your skills and the let's test ourselves test that everybody uh, may want to take a look at and see where, where you stand as an HPC member. So I will turn it over to you, Chair Stodal, as uh, far as opening up the discussion. I uh, uh, hope that uh, uh, everybody had a chance to see at least one of the seminars. Uh, uh, they were all, uh, I didn't, wasn't able to attend all, but uh, the, the, the four that I was able to attend, again, they're just uh, uh, a real benefit. And uh, the, the benefit of, of the, them being virtual is, is that we're able to bring in talented people from around the country uh, and they're live, and they're, the communication is 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 good. But like the uh, Dr. Seabrand, translating your skills, time, talent, and treasure, I think provides us all with uh, uh, provide me with an opportunity is is to wh what is my how can I participate in the uh, uh, improve my participation in the historic preservation process in, in, in our community and. Uh, a lot of questions and, and a lot of things to think about, and I found that really valuable. I also thought the disaster planning one, uh, e even though they were talking about uh, Miami and, uh, and, and, uh, and, and, and uh, tornadoes and hurricanes where there was real disaster, a, a lot of that applied to, to Southern Nevada in, in, in different ways. And with the climate uh, change that's going on, uh, it was one that exceeded my expectations. So those were two that uh, that, that stood out to me. Other commissioners that uh, want to comment on anything that they found interesting or valuable? Because some of this we want to report back to the uh, to uh, the commission itself. Vice chair. Yeah, vice chair Laramie. Um, just kind of adding on to some of what we heard earlier, especially around the mid-century buildings and in the kind of disaster planning space. Um, you know, I heard recently that in like the next 50 years, we're gonna have temperatures of 125 degrees and our buildings just aren't, they're not built to withstand those kinds of temperatures. I think most of our AC units are rated for like 115 and mine doesn't really work when it's hotter than 112. So thinking about some of these other programs like the CPACE program that was introduced to us today and I know that um, you know there's other weatherization programs that other communities have adopted as well. I think those are gonna start to be really important tools for us in the preservation space and thinking about how we can, not only because we have so many mid-century buildings and energy efficiency tends to be one of their biggest obstacles for restoration, um, but in, in thinking about what's gonna be aging into significance, we know that those buildings likely aren't built to withstand for the future either. So just kind of wanted to reflect on that. I don't have anything specific other than I think that's gonna be an important aspect for us. I agree. Other thoughts, questions, comments? Other than that, Dan, thank you very much for setting this up. Um, it was uh, uh, valuable, although the one with the, one with the uh, mid-century is occurring when we met, but that's okay, because it, it was recorded and we could see it at, 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 a, at a later date. So we can just request that they don't schedule during our meeting. <laughs> that would be uh, an opportunity. <laughs> uh, item number nine, uh, which is the 
21-0549-HPC1, discussion for possible action regarding approval of up to $600 in Historic Preservation Commission funding. Excuse me. Did I skip, skip one? Yes. On number eight. Oh. Let's move back to number eight, 21-0548-HPC1, discussion for possible action regarding the approval of Historic Preservation Commission funding of $250 to renew the HPC's membership with the National Trust for Preservation Leadership Forum. Uh, Stephen, for the record. So we have had this, you, you had this um, membership before even I got here, and I don't think we've not really utilized the um, opportunities that it provides, and we will start doing that. And a lot of it is, again, because COVID, prevented some of that from happening. But if we are able to renew this, it's only $250 and it does give us access to training courses. Uh, there's a quarterly publication called the Forum Journal. Uh, that does come to my office. I'm happy to bring it in if everybody would like to look at it. Uh, there are some grant funding opportunities uh, and there's as any membership, you know, we get the discount on conferences and some of the participating hotels through what's called the Historic Hotels of America. So this is an action item that I just need to vote on if the HPC is willing to take $250 out of their budget in order to renew this uh, membership. Look for a motion. This is Commissioner Cosgrove. I move that we approve agenda item number eight. We have a second. Second, Commissioner Modi. We have a motion and we have a second. Further discussion? General public? Hearing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Gets votes aye. Those opposed? Motion carries unanimously with the chair voting in favor of those in attendance. Thank you all. Now we'll move on to item number nine, 21-0549-HPC1, discussion for possible action regarding approval of up to $600 in Historic Preservation Commission funding for members to, of the HPC to attend the November 2nd through 5th, 2021 National Trust Preservation Leadership Forum. It will be a virtual conference. Uh, in the board meeting packet is a list of the topics to be covered uh, at, uh, at this year's conference. There's some good detail in there. Uh, so Dr. Seabrand, the next, really the next step. So Seabrand, for the record, and so once we do renew our membership, the, this is part of that same um, uh, organization, is we will get the discount on this virtual conference. It is November 2nd through the 5th. And it is the 250 for the first 10 partic participants and then $85 for each additional one. We're asking for up to $600 because we want to make, um, offer the opportunity for all staff to, um, including um, Mike and Teresa and Seth to also participate if they wish. And again, this is, um, so I just need a vote from the commission if they want to spend their budget of up to $600 on this conference and I just put, I don't think I, hold on one second, I need my. The conference sub themes are promoting equality and justice through historic preservation, sharpening essential practices of preservation and adapting to a changing climate, which as we just heard, that may be a topic of interest for this uh, board. The detailed list of all the sessions, there, it's a huge packet, so I wasn't able to include it all on here, but it's all available in the backup material that shows what they are hitting on exactly, such as community engagement, advocacy for heritage sites, interpreting sites, again, climate, diversity, and historic preservation, and underrepresented communities. Comments, discussion of the board? If not, we'd look for a motion. Commissioner Laramie, um, again, I've had the opportunity to attend National Trust 
conferences and they're also really great. They're definitely um, different than the National Alliance of the um, Preservation Commissioners. They tend to kind of have different focus. So I think for those that are available, it would also be really interesting and, and new material. And I'll make a motion to approve. We have a motion to approve. Do we have a second? Commissioner Beck, I second the motion. We have a motion and a second to approve the funding of up to $600 uh, for members to attend the HPC. Uh, a question, when we're saying up, will that depend on responses from the uh, the members we should tell you if we would like to attend or how will that work? Yes, so any member who, if you would like to attend, please email me and Teresa and then once we get the, the list, if you could please do that today or tomorrow, it would be very much appreciated. And then we will be able to register everybody. Right. And right, depending on how many members decide to participate will depend on how much we end up spending. And I'll update the commission at the next meeting of what the um, total monies right. are. All right, we have a motion, we have a second. Further questions? Hearing none, uh, all those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed? Motion carries unanimously with those in attendance and the chair voting in favor. Thank you all. My list says we're on number 10. Uh, HPC 210550, HPC 1, report by the Department of Planning regarding the director's update. Mike, will you be doing that or Dr. Zebrin? Okay, secret for the record. So, Director Floyd is um, not able to join us today, but he did not have any uh, updates other than to introduce Teresa, and we've already done that, so I think we're good. Okay. Well, what, there was a piece of news, though. The Huntridge Theater got voted by the uh, City Council to be on our. Well, you have one more item, right? Oh, okay. Oh. <laughs> Didn't mean to steal your thunder. <laughs> All right, let's see. We are, I'm on item 11, which is 21-0552-HPC1, a report by the Department of Planning regarding the project update list. Dr. Sebran? And here you go, sir. <laughs> uh, so for our updates, the Las Vegas High School, the National Register, we're still waiting on the district listing. This commission did complete their edits and it is currently with SHPO and it will be heard at the, their state board meeting in December. The Huntridge Theater, it is listed officially on the Las Vegas Historic Property Register. It was accepted by city council on the 1st of September. And if you look at our maps now, it is listed as green, uh, meaning that it is on the historic register. So any work that is done on the exterior of the building does require a certificate of appropriateness to come through this commission. For the grant we received from the National Park Service on the underrepresented community, we, I am in the process of drafting that RFP with our contract specialist um, in the contracts office, and that will be published the first week of October. That means it will go out for bid to, um, well, we do have the uh, list of cultural resource management organizations we send it to, but it also goes out to bid to the general public. Uh, the next update is the SHPO, the uh, Charleston Heights grant proposal. So I just heard back from them yesterday. So the SHPO did decide to award us the um, Historic Preservation Fund grant at a lower rate than we asked for. We asked for $50,000. They will award us $30,000. This does still need to go to public meeting on uh, September 30th. Anybody is welcome to listen in on that meeting. Um, I'll, I'll be on the meeting. Um, it's not a requirement. It's, it, it, it should pass. There shouldn't be any opposition to it. Once it is uh, heard publicly, then it would be official that we do have that grant. Floyd Land Park projects, um, as you recall, over this past year, we had quite a bit of things happening over at the park. It was quite busy. I do have updates on all the projects that we started. 
So the hay barn, uh, we were just out there on Monday. It's been delayed, of course, because of construction material delays due to COVID. And we finally did get the uh, notice to proceed with the door cuts. The water well project is done, the sewer line project and the skeet range project. And I do have photos here. So this is, oh, sorry, excuse me, just one minute. This is the, the hay barn. The orange writing on the walls is where the door cuts will be going oh. through. And uh, they are ha we are having weekly meetings out there, so we'll be able to monitor it very closely. The water well, the image on the left is from December, and the image on the right was taken just on Monday. And you can see they, this is, was the collapsed 1940s well that they needed to replace and it has been replaced right. with the, the new piping and hopefully it's not gonna collapse again, but that project is completed. Dan, would you back just for a second on the, on the where we're gonna cut the walls into the barn? Yes. I forgot, how old is that barn? Do you remember? The, it's, uh, it's 1940, I wanted to say 46, maybe 47. Is there any reason to save any of the bricks? <laughs> you know, I, I asked that question. Um, the contractor said they will try. They said that they often do destroy a lot of it when they cut through it, but we did specifically ask that they save the bricks. Well, okay, I mean, maybe just nice to have some representative. I agreed, yes, okay. yes, right. but Thank you. We'll, I'll be out there to, to see what we can do. Sure. Whoops, I'm going backwards. Uh, the water well, uh, finish the water well. The next one is the sewer line. I think that our uh, public works guys and did a, a really, or Parks and Recs did a really great job of putting everything back together. Wow. So they did have to, they went around the perimeter of the property, which wasn't near the historic core, but you know, I was out there all the time looking to make sure they weren't uncovering any types of artifacts, fossils, or anything of um, cultural or historic um, importance. And so the closest they did get on the sewer line for digging um, was close to the foreman's house there. So I don't know, maybe 20 feet or so, and they were able to replace everything. There was no damage done to any of the buildings there. So Dan, that pro project the, is completed. The sidewalk, uh, uh, are, are those squares are those designs on those i can't remember yeah it's uh, it's like a stamped pattern and they matched it as as closely as they possibly can they actually the stamps match it's because the the discoloration of for age they couldn't really match okay okay and then why is this not working Okay, thank you. Uh, and the skeet range, and this bottom picture is really hard to, to see, it just kind of looks like the black hole into oblivion. But on the upper left is the, so January of this year is when we started the project, and this is, remember, we had to do the remediation because of the contamination from the clay pigeons and all of the um, shotgun pellets. So they took out all of the, the boxes, the skeet boxes as the paths and, the picture on the right for June of this year is after they take, took off away all of the material, they buried it with dirt. And then the bottom image, that is blacktop, that's on top of gravel, which is the end result of um, this, the final, finalization of this project. So this is, again, it's still considered hazardous, so nobody is able to go there. It is also fenced off, in, including having the um, blacktop over everything. Uh, yes? I have one question. Whoops. Whoops, what, what happened? Um, is it, it, are there any plans to possibly put a sign out in that area to say what was there prior to having all of this removed? So, well, we do have the, the information signs there that do point to it. We don't have anything specifically at that spot. Um, if that's something you would like to explore, we can, um, I believe it was Cultural Affairs that did those original panels, was it? Yeah, we can work with them and see if we can put something up to explain what that was. I think it would be good um, to have a dates of use and when it was there since since there wasn't the ability to preserve any of this. So 
I know which sign you're talking about, and it does tell you there's the skeet range, but it doesn't provide right. additional information. Okay. We can look into that. And then I did send an email to everybody um, about from the NEO Museum. It's the invitation, and this is the a grant that you did approve uh, at our last meeting. This is the one part of their programming. They, the Neo Museum is inviting everybody to uh, this, the program that is going to be the panel of talking about the remembering the frontier strike 30 years later. And I just wanted to remind everybody and that is on the 30th of this month. And those are my updates, but happy to answer any questions if anybody has any. Questions? This side. Just a couple of real quick ones. Uh, the uh, uh, on the first page, uh, the third item down, the Shippo survey grant. We will get an update at our next at the October meeting. I think that's what we we approved a, a 60 day. Right. So the way it was, so I mean we can't officially move forward with it until it's approved at Shippo's public meeting. So once it's approved at Shippo's public meeting on the 30th, um, what we'll do is, again, I'll have to write the RFP and um, put, work with that with our contract specialist people and put it out for bid. I'm confused. About which one? Uh, I th I th okay, I, I'm, I am confused, and, and that is, I was thinking of that catalog Oh, the catalog, right. Um, okay, yeah, that's completely different. <laughs> the catalog is was an abeyance item. It will be on the October 27th meeting. Great, gotcha, okay, thank you. Sorry, I should have added no, that. Uh, uh, then on the, on the second page, the third item down, the Harrison House restoration, it says. Oh, you're looking at the other page. Uh, status uh, in progress, but delayed given till the end of the year. Is there any update on that? No, um, <laughs> in, a, in, a, in a short sentence, she's having difficulty finding funding to um, pay for the projects because, and again, this is a Centennial Commission grant. Um, okay. Uh, but she is finding difficulty finding the initial funding because remember, all of our grants are reimbursement grants, so people have to pay for the project, uh, their vendors and everything first, and then they are reimbursed. So it's delayed, and, and the Centennial Commission did give her until um, the end of December to complete this project. Okay. All right. uh, then on the uh, page three, update on historic properties, uh, Moulin Rouge columns, it says they'll be moved uh, from Cashman to the East Yard. Do you know if that's been done yet? N I do not. Um, I will follow up on that. And, and hopefully there's some <coughs> protection in some way of the, uh, I think the weather could take a lot of those small little parts of it off. Yes, they could. Okay. Uh, for the record, uh, Michael Howe, I believe when they were moved, they've been created, so they're stabilized, but if they're stored outside, we'll, we will want to make sure that they're covered as well. Great, that's great. And then the last one is the, is the Reed Whipple Theater. I was wondering if uh, we could get in the next, uh, 60 days, 90 days, and an update from uh, the new leadership at the Neon Museum where we stand on that's a city owned property. Yeah, we can we can get, we can a, get uh, an update. Uh, I know that project is delayed as well, though. Uh, yeah, and they have a new new leadership there. Yes. Effective a couple of months ago or so forth. That's why that we got the invitation. So great. Uh, if there are no further questions or comments, then we will move on to item number 12. 21-0553 HPC1 report by the Department of Planning regarding historic and archeological resources in the local media. Everybody's had a chance to, uh, to, to look at that. Now that uh, Dr. Seabrand has uh, some staff, I, I would suggest if you see something in the local media or that's about Las Vegas, maybe not in the local media, uh, a senator, so we can all share uh, that, inf that information. So I am on item 13. Discussion regarding, which is 21-0554, 
HPC 1, discussion regarding topics for future agenda items by the Historic Preservation Commission. Comments made during this portion of the agenda by individual commission members shall refer solely to proposals for future agenda items and any discussion shall be limited to whether or not such proposed items are uh, or the item is within the purview of the commission and or whether such proposed items shall be placed on a future agenda. No discussion regarding the substance of any such proposed topic shall occur and no action shall be taken on the proposed item for the agenda. Is there anybody who would like to have uh, an item on a future HPC agenda? Yes. Palancar for the record. Side, please, go ahead. Yes. Um, well, this is the second time I brought this up and I didn't see it on our agenda and it was supposed to be in this October agenda regarding creating and implementing guidelines, rules, regulations for the existing historic district that hasn't been done in a long time. John S. Park is the only one that we really have and I had asked that we would uh, somehow go over those and reconstruct or bring up to date for all the historic districts. And then the other was um, we were going to do uh, be proactive with uh, either surveying or watching the um, present historic sites in the city uh, or have a couple of the people in the commission that would do it, uh, watching for possible uh, entrance by homeless or for fire hazards to be proactive to prevent the problems we're having here in the city of, of good old buildings being uh, burnt down. And I had, this is the second time, of, maybe even the third time I've brought these two things up, so I hope they'll be on one item in our next meeting. It was supposed to be this meeting, but as I remember, they said it would be in far October, but should be in the minutes. Well, the, the minutes are online, so uh, if you want to double check and make sure that yeah, uh, that's what they're accurate. we were told. Okay. Any further discussion? Please. Commissioner Laramie, um, can we revisit the demo ordinance that we had discussed a handful of months ago and, um, you know, if that's still something the city's exploring or not? And at a f future date, I think it would be nice to learn a little bit more about um, how other cities are potentially addressing some of their weatherization needs. Um, and I'm specifically thinking for homeowners since so many of our historic properties right now are residential homes. We have districts and other residential districts that we're looking at. Are there programs that we should be advocating for or looking at to help with weatherization in those areas while, while also helping you know property owners preserve their homes? Are you saying weathering needs as in climate? Yeah, you know, energy efficiency, weatherization, what, however you want to term it. Further comments, questions? If not, then let's move on to the last item, which is uh, 14, citizens' participation. Public comment during this portion of the agenda must be limited to matters within the jurisdiction of the commission. No subject may be acted upon by the commission unless that, that subject is uh, on the agenda and is scheduled for action. If you wish to be heard, come forward, give your name for the record, the amount of discussion on any single <coughs> subject, as well as the amount of time uh, any single speaker is allowed may be limited. Would anybody like to speak at this time on the phone or in public? Hearing and seeing none, 
Thank you all. We are officially adjourned. Thank you. Thank you.